Welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series Christmas Edition. Uh, I'm having the, the distinct pleasure and opportunity to discuss glaucoma with two close friends and colleagues, Dr. Greg Caldwell and Dr. Mark Dunbar. Greg is in is a in private practice and consultative disease services in Johnstown and Duncansville, PA. Mark Dunbar is a 30 plus year veteran at Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. We're all fellows of the Optometric Glaucoma Society. And this talk came about last time Mark was doing a solo webinar. Uh, we had a period of time where we, we were kind of conversing about some things and going back and forth. And while we're doing that, I realized it, it'd be nice to uh, do a talk where it's just the three of us talking together. We have worked uh, together for so long, known each other for so long, have and been friends and colleagues so long, it's really pretty comfortable to just have these conversations. So we're going to kind of let everybody in, listen in as we're talking about it. You are welcome to put a question in the chat box. This is going to this is going to be kind of open ended, free flowing, and meant to be a relaxing conversation between three people talking about glaucoma. Greg, this is. Our 94th, I think, according to Vanessa, our 94th webinar that we've done. And because COPE is ending, that we're going to, uh, we're going to be slowing things down. I think you and I might actually have to get a hobby. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right, let's start off. I am or have been a consultant on a number of speakers bureaus, really Vices and Bausch and Loam and possibly Zeiss are the only ones current in the last year. Greg, talk about your disclosures. Yeah, the list goes from Alcon all the way down to Hero with regarding lectures, advisory boards, Allergan to Inova. I do sit as the PA medical director, which is uh, a managed Medicaid uh, in Pennsylvania. As I sit as the chairman of the advisory for diabetes and healthcare registries. Really, that list is up there really not to impress everyone. I'm not proud of it, nor trying to be, you know, um, bragging about it, but it's just in order to be able to bring education and try and to stay in the forefront. I just participate in all of that. But most importantly, this content of this webinar was independently prepared by all of us, uh, myself, Dr. Salka, Dr. Dunbar, and Going down to about the fifth bullet point, we have no, I have no direct financial or proprietary interest. But the sixth bullet point, more important, the content and the format of this course is presented without any commercial bias and not going to uh, claim any superiority. So that's all I got, Joe. Mark? Maybe we should call it Disclosures Greg Caldwell, Alcon to Zeiss, A to Z. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Uh, uh, your, yours is very well stated, Greg. I, I like that. And, and these are my consultants. I'm on for my disclosures, consultants, advisory boards, and again, same thing, not no claim of anybody or anything better than anybody else. Now, I do want to preface our talk tonight is these are cases that I've seen and put together. Mark has not seen any of these to my knowledge. I know Greg got a handout, but Greg tends not to study any of these in advance. So <laughs> nope. the, these are going to be uh, their off the cuff uh, remarks. And I think you'll be impressed at how, uh, how, how good they are on it. All right, first off, what to do? You know, sometimes we get in a situation where we're not quite sure what the right therapeutic avenue is, and we're gonna discuss it. He is a 52 year old male who was referred to me presumptively for ocular hypertension. Now, one parent had glaucoma, I'm putting that as a maybe, because when this all started out, he told me both of his parents had glaucoma. And then as things went on, he wasn't so sure then he thought, well, he's pretty sure his father had, wasn't sure about his mother then, pretty sure his father had glaucoma, but it got kind of bad and they took it out. So <laughs> as, they, as they say, IOP is only, only modifiable risk factor or maybe, maybe family history is modifiable. <laughs> well, anyway, his initial pressures were 32 and 30. He was seen in our general care clinic when I was at the university. I am now at Center for Sight USI, a med surge practice in Sarasota, Venice, Florida. So when he was referred over to me after one visit, his, he was put on a prostaglandin analog and his pressure dropped down to 17. Now that was all done prior to my seeing him after one visit. Now his corneas turned out to be thick, about 610. And the question is, should he have been treated and should we stop? 
And I'm going to leave it and turn it over to Greg and Mark to make a few comments, knowing that you don't have a lot of information in front of you other than what I just showed you. What are your thoughts here? Mark? Well, you said, I mean, if it was a one-time pressure reading of 32 and 30, I, you know, I would never make a decision based on one pressure. So, you know, obviously we don't know what a nerve looks like. It's the fact that he's 6'10 is, is really a good thing. I would have liked to have had a couple pressure readings and, and if he's consistently 32 and 30, if he's up, you know, if he's in that 30 range, I certainly, you know, may have been appropriate, um, you know, at a pressure 25 or 26 in a cornea that's 6'10", that I wouldn't have been too concerned and would not have treated. Again, I think over 30, you're, for most of us, I think our toes tingle a little bit, even in the presence of a thick cornea. But but again, I, I never like to make a decision just based on one pressure. I would have brought him back and got another pressure. And if it's consistently, then, you know, we start having the conversation. And I, I agree with you. I would like that as well. But here I am two weeks after he was yep. seen by one practitioner, put him out of medicine yep. for me to take him off, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of imparts almost a, a lack of a confidence. Right. And I, right. I, right. I agree with that. Yeah, I don't. And I agree. I'm not sure, you know, at this point, you can stop. I think you can just kind of see how things play out in a little bit. And obviously, we haven't seen the nerve or the OCT, and I assume we're going to have a normal field, but but that remains to be seen. Well, I'm gonna, um, uh, I'll share with you. Here Greg, is what optic nerves. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, what time of the day was it where there's 32s? You know, is this guy taking any maybe steroid eye drops to drive his pressures up? Is he using it for allergies? Has he got anything going on? The 610 certainly allows me to, uh, to breathe a little bit better. Um, you know, should we stop? I'm not sure if it, um, you know, if, if I would, I, I've done it enough times that people come in on, on pressures and just said, hey, you know, look, I get what the doc was doing. Didn't like a 32. I just saw Joe's nerves there. So I could say, look, your nerves look okay let's stop. And what I'd like to do is kind of maybe get a diurnal, you know, you know, pressure, get a morning, get an afternoon. You're most likely going to go back on drops, but I would just kind of like to get a, get an idea of what's going on here. Bef you know, before we really initiate maybe therapy for a longer period of time. So. Mark, why don't you, why don't you take a crack and tell me what you think about yeah. these, uh, these nerves. Well, he's got clearly a cup to disc asymmetry with the right looks a little more well-defined. I, I would call that maybe a 0.4, arguably a 0.45. I wouldn't quite go to a five. Again, two-dimensional photograph. It's certainly round. There's no, you know, there's no thinning. There's no notching. Um, the, the left one appears to be a smaller cup. I'd call that probably 0.2. You know, both of them look, color-wise, look great, and, and they do not look glaucomatous. You know, can we, you know, look at the size of the nerve and maybe you know, the, if the right nerve is bigger, can, can that account for the fact that the cup appears to be a little bit bigger? And again, it's, it's tough on a photograph, but, but the right nerve does appear to be a little bit bigger than the left. And, and again, that might account for the fact that there's cup to disc ratio asymmetry. But in general, they don't look glaucomatous. They, they, they really look pretty good. I would, you know, again, play the game. If we're going to do an OCT, I would predict it's going to be normal. I wouldn't predict any, really any thinning, but... That's just based on the appearance. Well, I will share with you, Mark. Uh, the right nerve is physically larger than the left in terms of disc area. That's number one. And number two, they're both small nerves. Not what? hypoplastic, but they're overall small nerves. Hmm. Great. Well, that's good because, you know, I think, you know, you want to be able to use the normative database in glaucoma. Hmm. And if there were particularly large nerves, obviously, sometimes that that doesn't help you. But But you should get some pretty good measurements. I mean, to me, that the RNFL looks robust in, in, in both eyes, just from the clinical photographs. Now, Greg, do you have anything to add to that? The, the only thing that I like to apply to, to, to this is the isn't rule in that left optic nerve. The isn't rule meaning that the inferior neuroretinal rim is thicker than the superior, than nasal and temporal. So I think uh, you know, Joe's over there on the right eye pointing that out. I think the inferior looks maybe equal to superior than, than nasal and temporal, but the left eye certainly fits the isn't rule where the inferior is thicker. Um, so maybe, you know, the little bit of a violation, but is it because just the nerve is bigger on that side? Um, but you know, I'm not. And then, and, and going back to remember, he, he's got a pressure of 32 and 30. These are not cup nerves. These are not typical 
you know, he, you know, just looking at the nerve and the pressure, you can, you know, it doesn't look like he's got damage per se. Although, you know, Greg's point about the right one inferior is it is, you know, maybe not as thick, but again, I, I would predict it's going to be, I would predict the OCT is going to be normal. I think so. See, see when, when I look at these, there, there are a number of features that I, that I look at when I interpret the optic nerve. And if there's anything you want to add as I'm going through this, please go right ahead. But one, I look at color and Mark, Mark already mentioned that, you know, they're nice and pink. You know, glaucoma is a pink perfused nerve. You know, you shouldn't see pallor. You know, pallor indicates to me something other than or in addition to glaucoma. The first thing I look at it is, you know, I look, I look at the color and we look at the size. Is it, is it small, medium or large? And that's just sort of a gestalt that I look at. Uh, large nerves, we're going to over, probably overdiagnose or overcall glaucoma. Small nerves, we might undercall it. You know, your average size nerves make it, you know, pretty easy. And I'm going to start looking at a number of things. I'm going to look for the presence or absence of parapapillary atrophy. And we see there's a little scleral crescent here. And, you know, that's not really what I call parapapillary atrophy. But that's a relatively soft sign for me. Uh, I don't put a lot into it. And some, in fact, some of the greatest examples of zone beta and zone alpha parapapillary atrophy were in normal students and residents, just you know, great examples. I also want to look for any focal neurofiber layer defects. I don't see any focal neurofiber layer defects in here. I'm going to look for the presence or absence of disc hemorrhages, and those buggers can be sometimes hard to, uh, hard to find. And that's why the, the disc photograph is so, is so helpful to us because we can stare here all day long and find things we may have missed clinically. I also want to look for the presence or absence of focal nerve, uh, focal nerve defects or neuroretinal rim defects, or as I say, I cut it in half. And does the top look like the bottom? When we do this, certainly here, the top looks like the bottom on the left eye. In the right eye, Greg kind of point out maybe a little bit of thinning there. Maybe it's equal up there when we, when we apply the isn't rule, but maybe it's not quite as robust, but I will tell you, it doesn't look compelling. You know, Mark, I agree. It doesn't really look compelling. We look at second thought. Well, let's, let's just pay attention to it. Now here are the visual fields and Greg, I know you love visual fields. So why don't you talk about this a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you know, the first thing I am looking at here is, uh, is it a 20, looks like a 24-2, and it is. 24-2 um, is totally acceptable in a glaucomatous visual field, as if you guys, Joe, and if you want to point superior uh, uh, temporal and inferior, it's going out 24 degrees, but if you look at it going nasally, it's going 30 degrees. And so a 24-2 that I like to point out to the colleagues is 24 everywhere else except nasally where the glaucoma defect is, and it's 30 degrees nasally because that's where the nasal defect uh, heads out. So totally acceptable. I like when the fovea is on, um, uh, when I do a 24-2 uh, fovea on, and I, do, um, I don't really do a, uh, I do a CETA standard on this because it crosses the threshold twice. And then that would be a, a, a good visual field. Now, going and looking at uh, the numbers here, it looks like, Joe, it's, you know, 0 0.03. It's, you know, it's pretty small, but is that the mean deviation? Is that what you see on your end? Maybe I uh, Which one are we looking at? In the, in the left gonna... eye, it's plus 0. 0.61. In here the right eye, it's minus 2.3. Yeah. So I just expanded it out. So yeah, I see the plus 0 0.61. So that's a, that's above. So, you know, that eye is not showing any uh, defect and then jumping over the minus 2.3. And um, Greg, that, that plus 0 0.61 could be correlating with this false positives of 13%. Yep. Whereas the false positive on this one is only 3%. Yeah. Cause they're being a little, little, little bit trigger happy. Uh, with that there. Um, so the left eye, you know, maybe a little trigger happy and the right eye, you know, Joe, he had that inferior, you know, thinning, this could be a little mild defect, you know, anything zero to five, I consider it a mild defect. And remember pattern standard deviation tells us how localized this is. 
So a one just kind of means it's kind of scattered. And as that pattern deviation becomes bigger, it means it's becoming more localized. And that's what happens in glaucoma because it's kind of that same arcuate drilling down and drilling down. So the pattern standard deviation of these ones, this kind of, especially in that right eye is just kind of showing you there that it is kind of scattered in that superior nasal defect. And now, one thing, one thing I want to share with you that you wouldn't know unless I told you, these are not his first fields. These are his worst fields. I actually pulled the worst field I could find that he ever did that was reliable. And this is what it is. And this is what we look at. Now, I also want to share something else with, with you. He has never turned a perfectly clear field in in his right eye. The next one might have two points right here. The next one might have that point and that point. The next one might have that point, that point, and that point. But he's never actually turned a perfectly clean visual field in. But this is the worst one I can possibly find. Mark, any thoughts here? Um, you know, if that's the worst one, you know, what I was going to say before you said all that, you know, I, I was going to assume it was his first time field. And, and those points, though they're in a critical area, um, you know, if that was the first time they showed up, I, I would discount it. Um, and again, you know, 15, 20 years ago, when this was all the information we had to make a decision to pressure a nerve in a field, and you've got a patient who isn't great at doing fields, um, you know, it, it, it made it a little bit difficult. And, and now that we have OCT, you, you know, that other piece of the puzzle, you want to correlate, you know, that field with the nerve and, and you know, trying to marry structure function. Um, you know, but, but again, keep in mind, you know, this is a patient who comes in with a pressure of 32 and it has a larger cup and, and that defect that in an area that's for glaucoma, that, that certainly becomes very suspicious in the presence of a thick cornea. So I still feel like I don't have enough information to, to make a decision yet, but, um, but, you know, you're kind of leaning in that direction that it might, that 32 may be something. And, and Joe, let me make a quick comment when you said mm -hmm. it was kind of jumping around mm -hmm. um, and, and that visual field defect in early glaucoma, you know, that's acceptable because, you know, the, the retinal ganglion cells, they just don't go on to off. They don't go from being living to dying. And so what happens is that's why you get that fluctuation, that retinal ganglion cell uh, can recover. It's down a little bit. It can recover. So that's why, you know, that visual field early on can kind of move around a little bit until the ganglion cells start to die. Uh, so that little bit of fluctuation early on is seems to be acceptable. So I, I think that's a critical point, you know, especially in glaucoma, in those points preceding definitive field loss, there can be variability, you know, in, in the difficult position that we're in as clinicians, seeing a patient and having to make a decision on a field you don't really know where they are in the gestalt of that, right? And so um, it becomes difficult. Is this just long-term fluctuation or is it in fact, indeed, you know, progression or, or a, a, a real defect? I think one thing to, uh, to point out is, you know, I do have a clean field here, but I can never get a clean, perfectly clean. It might just be one or two points, but, yeah. and, and the GHT would be within normal limits, but still couldn't ever get it quite clean. Now, I'm just going to share with you, you know, inocular hypertension from the OAT study. You know, what we did see is people who had thinner corneas had a greater risk of conversion to glaucoma. If they had thinner corneas and higher pressure, you know, they had a greater risk. But as we move up to the thicker corneas, even at a high pressure, the risk was really pretty low. And we look at vertical cup to disc ratio, people who had a larger vertical cup to disc ratio and a thinner cornea had a greater chance of converting from ocular hypertension, whereas the thicker ones had much less risk. And I think, you know, once we calculate a risk of about 15%, that's when we usually start to uh, recommend treatment. But uh, anything lower than that observation tends to be pretty good. So Greg, it brings me to polling question number one. I hope you have those ready. So what is the best management for this patient? Treat, <laughs> monitor, or refer to Mark Dunbar? That's funny. And Joe, as that's rolling in, we have a uh, question oh, yeah. here. Yes, I saw that, yes. It says, I have an optos 
and measure the optic nerve with its roller, what would be considered a large nerve, small nerve, and average nerve? Now, to me, and guys, just throwing out, for me, one point vertical, 1.7 to 1.9 is average. Uh, 1.5 under is thin. And about 2.3 and higher is, is large. Now, when I say that, there are some gaps in there. You know, there's a uh, extra medium or extra or, or medium minus. I know they don't have an exact overlap, but you know, when they're under 1.5 or over 2.3 is when they really kind of make it make a difference to me. Guys, what are your thoughts? I think that's about right. Oh, yeah, well, Jeff, anything Jeff. a little over two to me is is getting on the large side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know, Joe, same, you know, same thing. Two point one, anything over two. Um, I like your, I like kind of your gap thing in there, kind of your, you know, your normal plus or your, 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 ex, your large minus. But you know, those would be the cutoffs. You know, the the optic nerve is one one point eight millimeters in size, and then you know, on average, you can go larger than that or smaller than that. So I like the one point five and two. All right, so uh, we can end the poll and show the results. So a lot of people want to monitor the patient, number of people want to treat, and number of people want to refer to Mark Dunbar. Thankfully, mostly don't want to refer. <laughs> All right. Well, I didn't have an OCT, but you know, we we went a little bit further back in history. We, here's a GDX; it all works the same. You know, we have a thickness map, which looks pretty robust on the uh, on the left eye. We have a thickness map, which is really pretty sparse on the right. We have a lot of deviations from the normative database, especially inferiorly here. And the inner asymm asymmetry is uh, quite remarkable. And what I wanna point out here is the greatest departure from the normative database in this device, similar to an OCT, wa was inferior. So now that we know that, darn it, does that nerve look a lot more cup now? Yeah. So, well, I think everything we talked about, you know, you want, you want good, you know, congruity, right. You want things to kind of match up. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think you're kind of pointed in, in that direction in with, with all the information you have now. Yeah. You know, when you have, and as you, as you mentioned, Mark, and I agree with you, you know, it's more than the sum of the parts, yeah. you know, we point out, we, you notice that there is a, a thinner, maybe a, not compelling, but a thinner disc rim inferiorly but there's a cor corresponding visual field defect. It was, nothing was, was overwhelming or screaming out at us, but when we put it together, we realized, you know, this was not truly just an ocular hypertensive patient, but he actually had glaucoma in the right eye. So yeah, what I'm a little bit surprised about on this G, I used to have a GDX is that, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm not surprised maybe by that inferior hump missing but that superior hump kind of being as low as it is um you know is is, is a little surprising but you know it's it's glaucoma's glaucoma so yeah. so he you know i you know i i actually died he was sent to me as an ocular hypertensive and maybe his ocular hypertensive in the left eye but he was he was early glaucoma it's in the right eye and here's what happened to him when i followed him for about uh, i think about 15 years i followed for about 15 years and this is what happened to his, uh, his left eye. And you know, there's virtually no change. And both eyes were treated, by the way. And this is what happened to his right eye over the course of about 15 years. And what we see here is, you know, there's virtually no change. Now, I'm going to pose something to you fellows both and tell me what you think. Here's a person who's got glaucoma in one eye, thick cornea, high pressure, responded to the PGA. But let me ask you this. What do you think if I did nothing? I mean, it looks like I did a great job in treating him, but what if I did nothing? Do you think he would have stayed like this? I, I, I can't, I'm not going to discount the fact that he may actually have been remained stable even without treatment. Because even in a, in a treated glaucoma patient for a long period of time, usually over 10 years, I see some change and this fellow didn't change at all. Greg and Mark, what are your thoughts there? I'll let you go ahead. Greg? 
Well, I think there is a change here. Um, I think, you know, you took the stress off, Joe. And if you follow that trend analysis, he actually got better. If you look at the first visual field, it looks like 98 and he was minus 2.57, 2.17. And then uh, you jump down to the, to the bottom here. It, I can't see the, maybe the numbers, uh, are they on here anywhere? Uh, but it's a, but he's, you know, you can see the change analysis, but if you look at the progression analysis, it has an uphill, uphill trend. Mm -hmm. And we do see that in glaucoma it goes back to that retinal ganglion cell. It, it doesn't go from living to being dead. It goes from living to being wounded to a little bit more wounded to where it's very wounded to even more wounded to where it dies. And if you catch some of those ganglion cells, retinal ganglion cells in their stage where you take that stress off, I see an uphill trend there. And I think it's because you took that pressure of 32 originally and he was and this patient was allowed to recover. So I see an uphill trend on that. So, I, you know, I'm pretty, pretty excited. But, you know, to answer your question, could he have stayed? I have patients that are 32 um, that I am monitoring and they're not getting worse. And I have eight to nine years worth of data on them. So, you know, it could have been that this patient stayed the same, but my patient doesn't have a defect. This guy has a defect. He has nerve fiber layer loss. I would say he probably would have progressed. Hey, Mark, I've got I, a I, was, Go ahead, I would have thought slow progression too. Yeah. Mark, I had a, I had a question for you in, in not, not to put it in spot. Do you have, do you know when the first OCT was clinically available? Greg, you too. What, what, when was, the first OCT available. The first clinical description was 1991. Um, but the, str the stratus, when was that? About 2002 or so? Uh, 2000, yeah, 2000, 2001, 2002, maybe 2003. Greg, Start when the domain became available in 2007. So. And Greg, when when uh, when did ganglion cell come out? Do you remember? Oh, I don't. But uh, we did nerve fiber layer. I, I, Joe, if I had to take a guess, I'd say like nine or 10. Or okay. So. Because a, a, good, a good question was, did you obtain an OCT gang and cell layer evaluation? The answer is no. We, I, if you look at the dates there, I, we didn't have it. Yeah. You know, we, we barely had any sort of imaging at that point. Well, the answer would be whenever we started doing what spectral domain, because I don't think uh, time domain was enough to be able no. to, to, to go in and do that. So 2013 is, is, is kind of the date of spectral domain. And it took no, a few more years. 2007 was, was spectral domain. And, and, uh, and, and OptiView was really the first one to have ganglion cell complex. So, so that would, you know, that was probably available in, in 2008, 2009. So I, I think it was earlier than, than yeah, it could before. be. Yeah. All right. Question is, do you think OCT Zeiss is better, or more accurate than the OCT Maestro in measuring nerve fiber layer thickness? I work with both machines. I prefer the Zeiss. I, I don't have, I'm not going to make a comment about superiority or inferiority. You know, it's like, what car do you like to drive or what motorcycle yeah. do you like to ride? They're all very good and they'll get you where you need to go. Yeah. And I don't think there's enough of a, you know, separation in terms of, I, I, I think they all do a good job. As I said, it's, you know, it, it really is so much software centric with all these devices in glaucoma that, that it's just, you know, whatever one you really get used to is the one you really kind of like to look at. And any of the other ones, it's, you know, it's kind of learning new software and little nuances. So I, I, I couldn't tell you if one is better than the other. I mean, Maestro is, is, is spectral domain, right? So theoretically, yeah. um, you know, is it, you'd think that perhaps might be more accurate because you're doing, you know, a thousand, you know, several thousand actual scans a second, I, I, but I don't know. You know, I, 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 I in my, have my house, I have a Pearl River piano that I play. And if I sit down at a Yamaha piano, it doesn't sound any different. It's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's, to echo what Mark said, it's all about learning how to, and basically learning what's true and not true in the disease um, and learning how to interpret. I think that's the most important part. Why does my Cirrus give me a disc area and not a direct vertical disc size in millimeters? Are they comparable the answer is, I don't know why, why Zeiss chose to use that parameter, but to me, they're comparable in that they're giving me relative disk sizes. 
All right. Well, here's one, guys. All glaucoma is not created equal. She's a 71-year-old female who was diagnosed with glaucoma, opening, primary open angle glaucoma in 2009. Was treated with Travitan Z with a good response. She started at pressure 28, drops down to 18. And her central coronal thickness is average-ish. Now, she was seen by a local optometrist who was not comfortable with the, with the, the, the disease severity. So he referred the patient to me. I saw the patient for a visit or two, and then she disappeared. When I say she disappeared, she went to an ophthalmologist who was more convenient to her than, than I was. Now, our angles were open. There's no evidence of secondary glaucoma. And to be quite frank with you, fellas, this is all the information I had. And this was what came from, from the, the referring optometrist. These are the visual fields. So Mark, just on the scant amount of information, give me your thoughts, please. Well, again, it's just not enough really information. I mean, it could be like your other case where pressure 38 or 32 and you got down to, to 17 or 18. I mean, obviously good response to Travitan Z in, in an average thickness. I'd love to see the nerves. Are, are these the pattern deviations? And Yes, this, yeah. Uh, and and you've got the, the right eye on the right and the left eye on the left, or, or the right eye on the right? Uh, this, right this, is, this, this is That's OD right. and this is OS. Yeah. So, I mean, they, it's, it's a pattern that fits for glaucoma. I mean, it looks like a superior, um, you know, nasal defect in, in both eyes. Um, you know, again, are, you, it, does it respect midline? Are we looking at bitemporals? Uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's hard to, to see. It's, it's in that right eye almost does. And the left eye really does not. You've got a, a paracentral you know, defect in, in the left eye. So again, I don't know if there's enough information to, to make a decision. Clearly the, you know, the drops work. So mm -hmm. you got a good IOP uh, treatment response. Yeah, there, there's no gotcha in this one. Uh, I see what you say about the bitemporal, but it was, and this is only really the only, I probably saw her for one visit at this point. Greg, anything to add? The only thing I'll add is, you know, glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve. And when we, you know, you put up all this information to kind of get our brain thinking about, but, you know, we, we always resort back, what does the nerve look like? So we got to just remind everyone, you know, that glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve, but remember that it's not the only disease of the optic nerve, right? It's the number one disease of the optic nerve, but there's a lot of other things that, that are out there. So let, you know, this is always nice to have this information to kind of get us thinking and, and, and during these talks, but I think that's why we always resort to, okay, what does the nerve look like? So. I will tell you that this did not uh, impress me in any way. I mean, this is very typical. You've got a patient who's got probably moderate glaucoma from the visual field, uh, pressure 28, average pachymetry, you know, no secondary condition, medical health, okay. Good response to medicine. To me, this is typical POAG, you know, that we, that we all see every day. Yeah. Okay, well, she comes back to me three years later. She's 2030 and 2400. Now, she was not lost to follow-up. She was seeing a very reasonable uh, practitioner, op ophthalmologist in the area. And I have no reason to believe that this person did anything but uh, superior care for this patient. But she comes back to me now, 2030 and 2400. She tells me she's had trabeculoplasty twice in each eye. She's using Lumigan, Comigan, and Azopt. She had used an oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitor three times a day, but her hands and feet hurt too much to continue. She knew the word pilocarpine. She told it to me, but it gave her motion sickness and couldn't use it. And her pressure is 22 and 38. And this is what she looks like now. And I can't get a left eye visual field because her vision is just too poor. She can't respond well. All right, fellas, go at it. What do you think? Was anybody expecting this? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty significant progression, you know. Now, you know, the, the one thing I would say is, you know, this is not a, 
you know, when, when, when the glaucoma is this bad, she really needs to be followed with the, a 10-2 visual field and, and not a 24, because you really just don't have enough points to, to really test. Oh, and, indeed. And, and then, you know, I said, what I gave you was my first visit. This is my first visit back. But yeah. you're right. She needs a 10. Yeah. And she right. also needs a tube <laughs> or a trap. Take your pick. But, uh, you know. I mean, if she, she's clearly on maximal medical therapy and uh, an advanced glaucomatous field loss, did you say what her central vision was at this point, 2100? She is 2030 right eye, 2400 left eye. Okay. Greg, your thoughts here? Yeah, yeah just a rapid progressor here. Just a yeah. rapid progressor in glaucoma. You know, you have, you have two really subsets of glaucoma patients that are out there. You have those who are you know, kind of the slow progressors and those that are kind of rapid progressors. I think the first few years we try to, to determine, do I have a rapid progressor? And she would fall into the rapid uh, progressor type. But the interesting thing about the rapid progressor is look at how much care she's been getting. She's getting all the medicines, trabeculoplasty, orals, meiotics, and now she's still coming back with that kind of pressure. All right, Greg brings me a polling question number two. What's the best management for this patient? Continue meds and amplify therapy in some way. Repeat SLT. Re refer for invasive surgery. Refer for a mixed procedure or refer to Mark Dunbar. I'll let people think about that. Oh, I see a couple of questions came in. So let's take a look at those. Ba, 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 ba. If you believe the visual field, you have a central point effect, and by definition, this patient has advanced glaucoma, the answer would be yes. Anytime any of those four paracentral points are less than zero, you, you can consider that uh, advanced, despite, you know, regardless of the mean deviation. Uh, overall, I thought it was just a, a moderate case, but I agree, I agree with you. And that's why the, the optometrist referred the patient out. He wasn't comfortable with that. And Joe, the question before that, it says, why does Cirrus give disc area and not vertical disc in millimeters? Mm -hmm. Is that these algorithms that, the, that these units use, they take that all into account, right? Mm -hmm. I have had patients come in that have the same amount of nerve fiber layer thickness, let's say all around the clock hours. Let's say it was just identical. One gets flagged as yellow and one gets flagged as, as, as green, you know, green disease or normal. And the other one is saying, hey, watch it. And it's like 71, 71, you know, 113, 113, 71, 71, 113, 113. Everything matches. The instrument is saying this one is in green, this one's in yellow, but the, the, the disc area might be a little bit larger, smaller even though the numbers are the same around that are being measured as thickness. And that's why they are not using a vertical, vertical disc area. They're using these measurements that all get plugged into this algorithm to try and give you that, that uh, statistical database. So that's why they do volume versus a vertical disc. So. Excellent. Okay. Well, by a little bit, refer for invasive surgery was the uh, number one choice. There's no right, there, we don't have a lot of, we're not looking for right or wrong answers. Uh, what I think is remarkable is the exact same uh, percentage is, is wanting to refer to Mark Dunbar. <laughs> <laughs> so they have a lot of faith in you. Yeah. All right, so let's follow this patient. So she comes to see me in, two, in 2014. Let me go back, okay. You know, and I, I, I do think, you know, I don't think you're going to get and, you know, MIGs weren't around that in that time. But, you know, you're really not going to get the kind of pressure uh, lowering effect with with a MIG that you that you're really going to need. I mean, this is somebody where I, I think you've got a target pressure below 15, you know, at least in the left eye. I think you're and, and, and the right eye as well with that type of field loss. So I think you're looking at really trying to get that pressure 12, 13, 14. And, and the question is, well. How do you get there? You know, she's already on the kitchen sink. So you're really, you're not going to be able to do that with, with standard medical therapy. She's already had SLT and, and really have not had, uh, you know, where you need to be. I was going to say not a good response, but we don't really know that for sure. So, 
you know, this is somebody who really needs uh, an invasive surgery, either a trab or a tube, and 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 she needs to be down in that, you know, low teens. And Mark, or the, I, or, the or the only MIG that would fall into that category, and it's just by definition would maybe maybe a Zen, because yeah. Zens can get down there pretty pretty low. But uh, um, but other than that, Mark, I agree one hundred. You're not going to do a uh, cohook dual blade. You're not going to put an eye stent inject in there. Um, I agree. The only one that might fall into that category would be a Zen uh, stent, but uh, but I agree. It probably needs more mitomycin and some type of maybe shunting put done. So, well, one one thing I didn't share with I guess we had a little ahead of myself with it right now is the first thing that she told me when she came back. She told me, "I know I need surgery. I don't want surgery," and. That's why, in my opinion, why she left the ophthalmologist and came back was because he wanted to do surgery and she didn't want to have anything to do with it. How old is she at this point? Uh, early okay. 70s. Yep. So I explained to her the need. We discussed it. Uh, I even offered to refer her to our colleagues down at Bascom Palmer, at least for a look-see and to hear what they had to say, and she refused. And I documented it and explained to her her risk of vision loss and blindness, and she acknowledged that she understood that. And I continued to follow her. Now, every visit, I would document long discussion, risk of blindness, need surgery, surgical consult. She always declined. Well, I saw her in 2014 and she had disappeared and had not seen her since uh, September of 2013. Now she comes back, she's 2050 in light perception. Her pressure is 36 and 30. Now what? Mark, thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, you have to try to understand what her fears are. You know, a lot of patients are, are afraid of having anything done with their eyes. So I think you wonder, is it just really a matter of helping her understand, you know, the, the nature of the surgery, trying to paint really a picture of, of no pain. It's not going to be red. You're going to, you know, I don't know, just trying to paint it in a positive light. Cause, cause obviously she's going down the tube. She's going to be NLP in the right eye before long, if she doesn't, you know, really act. And, you know, she's pressure 36, you know, the, the left eye, we kind of write off at this point. Um, so you really are just trying to save her, her right eye. And, and again, it's the only way you get there is, is by surgical intervention. So Mark, she's going down the tubes without a tube. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, that, that, I, I think Mark, there's a, there's a lecture title for you. Yeah. <laughs> down the tubes without a tube. Just like I had the idea that my next lecture is going to be end of day GCA. We talk about that during our, our warm up. If only I could write songs that well. Yeah. Anyway, we discussed surgery. She declined it again, and I will tell you her response. Her 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 comment to me was, "If I have surgery, can you guarantee I won't lose vision?" Yeah. And the answer is no, because one, you can have a complication. She can lose her vision. Yeah. But, but, you, know, it's, you, you might she's could slip in the shower she can mm -hmm. you know get in a car accident on the way home i mean there's all types yeah. of you know what ifs that are that are you know possibilities but mm -hmm. it doesn't stop us from you know taking a shower yeah. you know walking down the hallway or getting in a car but she you know she, i explained to her no you could have a complication you can lose your vision you can have no complication and still have vision loss or you can have no complication no vision loss, the surgery works, and you still go blind from glaucoma. I can't, I can't guarantee anything. Now, if anybody's asking or thinking about, well, why don't you involve the family? Well, HIPAA does not allow me. And I do know at one point she was with her son who was in the waiting room. I asked, should I bring him in? Can I bring him in? No, no, no. I'll tell him everything. I'd rather not. All right. So, Greg, that brings me to polling question number three. What's the best plan for this patient? Educate about blindness and continue medical therapy. Fire the patient from your practice or refer to Mark Dunbar. <laughs> I 
There's a question, your patient have cataract surgery, any pressure to help removing natural lens? Yeah, but it's not going to be curative in a situation like this. And to be honest, she doesn't want cataract surgery. She doesn't want, she doesn't want anything. And in a situation like this, cataract surgery does have a bit of a increased risk of vision loss. Joe and Mark, you guys are definitely more, you know, with all the writing and, and publishing that you guys do, um, you know, slightly more up on the studies. I believe, you know, we used to see that there was a drop in IOP after cataract surgery, just alone, no MIGs. But I believe that when you follow them over time, that their pressure just returned back to normal, um, maybe a point uh, or, or two at most. Yeah. Um, so just removing the natural lens, I think over time, the IOP just goes back to its original state. Any thoughts on that? I, no, I, I, I agree. Six yeah. months, maybe 12 months you get out of it. Okay, a lot of people are going to hang on to the patient, explain, you know, the, the risk of blindness and continue the therapy. Some people want to fire the, the practice, but it warms my heart to see more people referring to Mark Dunbar now. Yeah, yeah. See where this is going. Referring a patient out is kind of like firing them. I, 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 can, I can see that. Uh, refer, referring them out to, to, to somebody who can do something that I can't uh, is, I think, viable. But saying, okay, well, you won't, you won't do what I say, so you have to leave. I don't want to see you again. I, you know, I, 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 I kept you know, her on therapy. She no shows until 2015, but was requesting medication refills throughout. She comes in using Comigan only, had run out of Azopt and Travitan. Her, pressure, her, her vision is 2060 and no light perception in the left eye. Her pressure is 46 and 72. This is open angle glaucoma. I refill all medicines and she declined surgery again. She comes back six of 15, using meds regularly, but was confused when to use Travitan, so she didn't use in the past week. Her vision was unchanged. Uh, she didn't go from no light perception to no light perception minus two. Her pressure is 40 and 53 on all these meds and after everything she's gone through. But ironically enough, she had new views on surgery now. And what she told me was, you know, if I had vision in my left eye, I would undergo surgery in my right eye. But because I have no vision in my left eye, if I have a complication, I'll lose all my vision altogether which she's saying, you know, three years later. <laughs> you know, too little, too late at that point. Now she changed her mind on surgery. Greg, Mark, any, any last, last thoughts on this one? No, it's just a sad case. You know, it's just, it is. Um, it's just dumb. But remember, all glaucoma, all glaucoma is not created equal. When, when, when I started this case and when we started talking about it, it seemed like run-of-the-mill open-angle glaucoma. Pressure 28 drops down to 18, one medicine, you know, somewhat moderate to, you know, vision threatening glaucoma, but it was pretty typical. Yeah. And it followed an atypical course. And that's why we follow patients the way we do. We don't see them every year or two years. We see them every three to four months until we really know what's going on. And when they're stable, then we start, we start tapering them back. You know, as Greg, Greg said, a rapid progressor. Some people will, pro will progress rapidly even with treatment. And some people will progress slowly even without treatment. Or the phrase I like to use is, you might be Keith Richards, you might be Keith Moon. You don't know who's who. You know, two people with uh, a lifestyle pro prone to an early death. One person died early, one person's still on tour. Who knows? Yep. Any final thoughts, guys? No. All right. As good as it gets. He's a 63-year-old male who knows he has glaucoma, but doesn't follow through with the treatment. Now, he acknowledged he got poor care and poor access to care when he lived in the Caribbean. I believe he lived in Jamaica. He was referred to me. His pressure was 43 in the right eye, 60 in the left. His angles were opened by gonioscopy and each eye. He had hand motion vision in the right eye. 2040 vision in the left eye with a small temporal island of vision in the left eye. We good guys? Yeah, I'd pair them up with the other patient and just yeah, have yeah. them walk, uh, you know, with yeah. right eye to left eye and then they'll be a good pair. So, Well, here is his 
optic nerves. I don't think we have to go through an extensive yeah. evaluation. Oh. I think we all agree these are pretty end stage. Joe, why don't you why don't you point out uh, where those vessels are bending with your pointer, just so people can see Look bending right, right there, there. Yeah. bending right there, bending there. There's a bend there. There's a bend there. You know, there's a nasal rim. Now this is his visual field, and this is his good eye, and this is a ten dash two. And he's twenty forty in this eye, correct? Twenty forty. What are your thoughts there, guys? You know, again, this is surgical. You know, this just with those pressures and poor compliance um, and really where he needs to be, just like the last patient, he really needs to 12, 13, you know, in that eye at, at the highest. And, and the only way you're going to get there, you know, you really don't have a lot of room yet to, to play around. You know, this is one of those you can't, you know, let's not do step therapy. It's either kitchen sink or, as I said, I, I, I think this becomes surgical right now mark, mark what what are the risk of surgeries here well like all of them right there's risk of endophthalmitis hypotony maculopathy um you know retinal detachment infection i mean all those are but but again you know you play the odds what the, that risk is rel is is statistically really low less than 0 0.1 0 0.00 whatever it is and your your risk of you know, snuffing out what's left is much higher than than the risk of of a of a surgical procedure. Greg, your thoughts here? Yeah, I, I hear your your concerns of surgery. You know, I I, you know, I think we're all old enough that we grew up, uh, you know, managing trabs and choroidals and macular, you know, detachments and swelling. You know, I can tell you the last five years, I can I'm really pleased with the with the outcomes and uh, that are out there now with surgery. Yeah. I'm still kind of stuck in the day of remembering all the crazy craziness. Um, I would certainly get this to a, to a surgeon to see if they wanted to do surgery um, and, and to try and get this pressure as low as it can be. And if they didn't, then it's back in our court. So, um, you know, like I said, I hear the concerns of all the post-op complications, but they're pretty good now, so. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. They are pretty good now. But I want to point out here, Greg, this is, two th this is 20 years ago. You know, he would have got an anti-metabolite, especially being African-American. You know, mm -hmm. I, the success was still good. Complications, though. He's uninsured. He is not an American citizen. There's, you know, there, there's a heck of a lot I can't do here. Uh, surgery, yes. You know, there, there, there is some risk. I, I've actually shown this to a glaucoma a surgeon. He said he would, you know, this is the kind of person we don't like to do, do surgery on for the risk of, of, of losing that fixation. Now, he's 2040. He comes in. He's got a paper with him. He reads his paper. You know, he watches the uh, football game. He tells me, hey, did you see what happened to the Dolphins last week? And my response was, uh, yeah, did you? <laughs> yeah. Polling question number four, Greg. What's the best management for this patient? Medicines, laser, MIGs, invasive glaucoma surgery, or refer to Mark Dunbar? <laughs> and people are whipping through here. Doing great. Oh, a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, right. Let's see. Needs Anything? to get a tube. Okay. I think you can call social services without violating HIPAA or the social, social economic mental concerns on. Well, I think maybe maybe that, that that was the last patient. That was the previous one. That's what yeah. I think. He needs to be traded or trapped. I mean, tra trabeculectomy down during the, the spell check. All right, I'm going to end, share the results. Invasive, you know, guys that, you know, they're, that, you know, we're in agreement, needs invasive glaucoma surgery. Uh, looks like a significant people still want to refer to uh, Mark Dunbar. Who's <laughs> growing <laughs> glaucoma practice. Okay, well, surgery was not in the immediate option for this person. And 
Indeed, I did hit him, quote unquote, with a kitchen sink over several weeks. Uh, I didn't add medicines all at once. He ended up on Timolol, Bermonidine fixed combination, Brinzolamide, and Travacrost in his left eye, which is his good eye. Travacrost only in his right eye because he has a hand motion vision. His pressure ended up at about 30 in the right eye and about 10 to 13 consistently in the left eye. Now, he never missed his appointment. And I said non-compliance because he didn't really have access to care where he was. Mm -hmm. He never would miss an appointment. His sister would always drop him off, pick him up later. And one day I stopped the exam and said, Doug, how, how do you feel? And he, he, he's taken aback. I said, how do you feel about things? He said, you know, I'm thankful things are as good for me as they are. Hmm. Mark, any thoughts? Greg, any thoughts nope. here? Yeah, it's just a, a huge burden, you know, in terms of the, the treatment, you know, responsibility. And, and I think that's, you know, where he obviously needs to be that 10 to 13. But so it's one bottle, um, two, bo three bottles, right? Yep. And, and, you know, the economics, of course, you said he's not insured. Indeed. So that's, a, that, that's a significant economic burden to have to face every, uh, you know, every, every month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, the, in a situation like this, I would have his family buy anything that we could generically to keep them invested. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to either get him patient assistance for the medicines from the drug companies when they were branded medicines, or I did uh, help him out. He was a very nice guy, the kind of person who's very neighborly you want to do things for. Yeah, no, but I acknowledge, I've always said, treating a patient with samples is like feeding a stray cat. You know, after 30 days, it's now your cat and you're responsible. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what, but we don't, we usually don't think we're going to get that good a response with medicines, but sometimes we don't know until we try. Well, this is what happened to him. This is 2001. This is 2005. This is 2006, and this was 2008. Greg, what do you think is going on here? Well, looking at it pretty quickly, it looks pretty stable. Yeah. Well, 2009, his vision is going down. He's slowly getting worse. And his response is, we had a good run, Joe. I appreciate all you did for me. I, I, you know, but the question is, is it cataract or glaucoma? And this is what happened over the course, uh, you know, when I look at it, you know, for eight years and his vision going down really was actually more cataract. His, his glaucoma really didn't progress uh, at that low pressure level. So I was able to get cataract surgery on a humanitarian basis from a local practitioner. Nobody really wanted to do surgery. The surgeon who did said he would only do it if I told the patient the risk of total blindness and he took it. He is about 2151 day post op, felt he was seeing beautifully. He ended up 2070 at distance. He got 2050 at near and, and, and was very happy. Now, one day I came into my office and there was a voicemail from his sister. Please give me a call. I had a very bad feeling. So I called his sister and found out he, uh, he had passed away over, you know, from natural, natural causes. But advanced disease get a low pressure, keep it low, and these patients can actually do fairly well. For eight years, he maintained his, his function, even though he had very, very, very bad disease. Guys, any final comments or questions here? You did your job, right? I mean, that's what it's all about, preserving vision for a lifetime. And, and uh, you know, had you not really developed a relationship to be able to take care of him and the trust, you know, he could have had a much worse, probably would have had a much worse outcome. And I think that's you know, as optometrists, that's really, as you said, it's like becomes like a stray cat. You, you take personal responsibility, you do everything you can to, you know, to preserve vision. And, and sometimes it works just like I think in this fellow, um, sometimes it doesn't work, but you, you do really everything you can, you know, because you do, you take it personal. It's, it's you, it's your responsibility. And I think, you know, a lot of these patients see that and rec rec you know, recognize it. Well, here's a patient 57 year old female diagnosed with glaucoma in 2008 based upon disc appearance and abnormal GDX. Was treated with Travitan Z, somehow migrated to our university, and there was seen in our, in our general care clinic 
Uh, each visit was by a different person. And some of the assessments that were written in his chart was glaucoma by history, good pressure, continue present meds, poor comply compliance can lead to blindness. Visual fields had dense, superior, and inferior arcuate defects. And somebody had written, do not use fields for this patient. Now, generally, when I see a phrase, the, the, the phrase that I, I note right here is glaucoma by history. And to me, when I look at that in a large facility or other from coming from other places, that tells me, you know, the patient's been diagnosed with it, but, you know, I'm not motivated to really find out if it's true or not. Greg, what are your thoughts on the visual fields here? Uh, left eye is a minus, you know, 12.67. The first thing I wanted to look at is make sure there wasn't anything kind of neuro going on here. And um, what I like to do for that, and I, I like to share this, is I look at the grayscale because if we look down here at pattern deviation, we can miss it. The grayscale can sometimes identify neurogenic patterns, Lisa has for me, very helpful. And, you know, looking at that, uh, that superior temporal quadrant looks not really glaucomatous, but uh, the nasal side over here in this left eye. Um, so it looks, you know, maybe a, you know, pie in the sky there on this, on this one, just to be careful, just throwing it out there. It could mm -hmm. be an arcuate over there um, looking at it, looking at it, but you know, if it is glaucoma, it's definitely worse in the right eye than the left eye based on the six minus 16.6, um, in that eye versus the, uh, uh, almost 13. So and what are your thoughts on, on, on useful information or reliability of these fields? Yeah, the false negatives, uh, you know, it's a sleepy visual field in this left one. Uh, the right eye is definitely uh, a, a sleepy visual field there. So, Mark, yeah, you know, I it, it it's you can have certainly neurologic fields superimposed on a glaucoma field, and this would, if that were the case, it would be really difficult in this patient to be able to kind of pull that out. Um, but again, it goes back to looking at nerves and are they pale or are they, you know, cupped and pale or just cupped. Um, you know, I've clearly advanced field loss. Um, well, I'm going to show you the GDX that came in with the patient. The patient brought it. I can see right here it says diagnosis G, Rx Travertan Z, one drop each eye at bedtime, ILP check three months. And I know that this is older technology, very similar to uh, OCT. And we have a, a pretty reasonable thickness map here, but what I what I noticed there is a very good inter-eye symmetry. So let's pass by this and, you know, Mark, why don't you talk about these nerves here? Yeah. So, I mean, just real quick, um, you know, the first thing is, you know, those visual fields don't fit those optic nerves. Again, goes back to color, you know, the right eye looks good, you know, maybe 0.3 by 0.4. So maybe a little bit vertical compared to horizontal, but you know, no significant thinning or notching, you know, does follow the isn't rule, at least in the right eye. I mean, that looks pretty good. And I would expect if we're doing an OCT, it would be, it would be normal. But again, the main point is it really does not fit that visual field that we saw. The left one, a little bit larger, maybe a little more vertical. You could argue inferior temporal thinning a little bit. It looks like, at least on that image, there's a, you know, you take a step back. I don't have a laser pointer, but it looks like there's a nerve fiber layer defect you know, from about four o'clock to 10, just if you were having to guess, looking at color change of the, of the retina coming up to the nerve. But, but again, this doesn't, it's not a visual field, doesn't fit what we saw in the nerve. And even that GDX, you know, doesn't quite fit what we saw in the nerve. So poor congruity across the board in, is, I think. Greg, what are your opinions? Yeah, I, I mean, nothing really other than echo what Mark says. I'm not really convinced it's glaucoma. Glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve, and those nerves look pretty good and don't match those visual fields. We got to do some more digging. What do, what do you What do you want to do next? Um, well, you, you were, what, what year are we here now? So that will help me out. <laughs> There's a GDX. 
So we're back in 2001. So, well, first of all, how are the pupils doing with this, with this person? Normal. So normal pupils. So maybe we got something, you know, retro uh, going on here. I'd repeat the visual field. I know uh, they said, don't do the visual fields, but I'd repeat the visual field. I repeated a, a, a GDX because that's what we had at the time. Inner eye symmetry is still pretty good. The thickness maps still look pretty good to me. And I agree, repeat the field. This is repeating the field. Mm -hmm. So how are we gonna approach, the, approach this patient right now? Not oh, this polling question. So there, there are the visual fields. You wanna launch poll number five. What's the best management for this patient? Leave her on medication because somewhere else, possibly an ophthalmologist put her on. Stop the medication and see what happens or refer to Mark Dunbar. <laughs> What was the pressure? What was the IOP on, on treatment? The IOP on treatment, I don't think I gave you. It was in the uh, low to mid teens. Okay, people are weighing in. Okay, we're slowing down. So sharing the results. Most people want to stop the medicine and see what happens. Some people want to leave, leave her on. And a number of people still want to refer to Mark Dunbar, which is always a viable option. Even when it's not. <laughs> so her, I'm sorry, her treated pressure is 14 in each eye. Fields, disc, imaging was ultimately normal. Stop the meds, and their pressure skyrockets up, or skyrockets up to 17 and 18. New diagnosis, she's normal. Yeah. So, Mark, how do you, how do you handle a situation like this? You know the the implications. Now, you know she's been she's been tr using a medicine branded out of pocket, 1,200 a year for four years. Now you see all this. How do you want to handle this? Well, you say, lucky that you came to see me. <laughs> I, I cured your glaucoma. You don't need it anymore. You know, I, it's a good one. I mean, obviously, it, it's, it's all about relationship and trust. And, and, you know, you wouldn't stop a medicine, I think, on the first visit. But I think you, you do try to, you know, get data. You know, she obviously got it in terms of doing visual fields, finally understood it. Um, and, and so, you know, it is what it is and, and you can kind of show what a field looks like and show that, you know, just explain everything to her. And, and, you know, I think she would just be very grateful to know that you were able to figure it out. You were able to really discover she doesn't have the disease and, and you don't need it. You know, we've, we've all been in that situation where we're, you know, somebody comes on a med and you look and you go, this patient doesn't have glaucoma. And, and you, you, you know, you start slow, let's stop it and see what happens to the pressure. If it, goes up to 22 or 25 or 30, then we may have to start it again, but. Yeah, I, I had a, a very similar patient like that. And I said, I think uh, you're fine. I'm going to stop the medicine and see what happens. And pressure went up to 42. And I said, I think I'm going to put yeah. you back on. Yeah, exactly. That happened. Greg, how do you, how do you address this? Or how do you handle this? Yeah, Joe, this, this has happened quite a bit over the years with the ocular hypertensive treatment study coming out and, and, you know, not sure what to do with it. Now we kind of apply it and have better instruments, right? So back in the day, we were telling people to adjust pressures up and down, and we were taking thin corneas and raising pressures, which we know not to do now. And then we were saying you have a large cup, you know, large cup to disc ratio, which was a high risk factor, you know, when people were putting, uh, you know, uh, you know, patients on glaucoma meds. So I've stopped quite a few. And it just comes down and you just say, hey, look, you know, things evolve over time. You know, I have some pretty cool instruments here. I'm able to do your nerve fiber layer and, you know, my visual field might be a little bit different. We got a little bit better reliability and looking at your nerve, you know, you just say, hey, look, you know, I think we do a trial of, you know, stopping the medication. That's good news. It's not going to be, you know, an irritant to your eye. If we do need it, then it's not an irritant. It's helping to save things. And and let's just see what happens. So I've stopped over the years, even in this year, 
you know, people on medication. I just think, yeah, that's what we have to do. You just have to learn how to, and Mark said, you got to have trust and just kind of explain it in a, in a nice way, not to get, um, you know, any suspicion out of what the other doctor, you know, you know, were they competent, not competent. You just say, look, you know, I wasn't there at that time. Whenever they made the diagnosis, I might've done the same thing, but here's what we're going to do now. So, um, you know, it's, I think we've all learned how to maybe do that, um, uh, yeah. over the years. So, yeah, the, the script that I like to, I like to say is when I've collected all this data, I'd be getting by saying, you know, since we were, you were diagnosed, there are things we know now about glaucoma that we didn't know a little while ago. And there's more I know about you that we didn't know a little bit more, but we didn't know about before. I think it's safe to follow you without medicines for a period of time to see what happens. And generally patients are, are agreeable to that. And of course, we check the pressure a couple of times. And, you know, my experience has been after a year and they're still off medicines, they forgot it ever happened. <laughs> and there's, you know, no, nobody, nobody is uh, insulted or, or offended or maligned in any way. And it's, it's always a clinical pearl. I've always said to patients, you know, if you got a funny looking nerve at all, you better be a good field taker. Otherwise, don't complain if you get treated for a disease that you don't really have. All right, here's one that we're going to work through. It's important to look at all of the data. It's a, she's a 62-year-old female glaucoma suspect. 2020 each eye. I didn't. I'd never got central coronal thickness on her. I, I only saw her. I didn't see her enough to get that. I don't think I got the very first visit. Her pressure is 17 to 18 on multiple occasions. Biomicroscopy is normal and angles are open. Okay, ready guys? Here are her OCTs. And Mark, you, you, you work with Cirrus a little bit more, yeah. I think, than Greg does. Yeah. So tell me what you think. So you got pretty uh, reliable scans. Both of them are eight out of 10. You know, you look at the thickness map and, and the one thing, you can see on the thickness map is there is some asymmetry in the thickness. The, the left one is a little maybe thinner, especially inferior, a little bit superior, but, but you can see what, what almost might look like a, a, a nerve fiber layer defect at, at five o'clock. Now, interestingly, that doesn't really show up on the deviation map. The deviation map's really pretty good at, at being able to pick that up by the way. Um, and, and of course, if we're looking at numbers there, you know, it, it looks pretty good. It's all green. Um, you look on the top, the average RNFL thickness, I think it's 103 on the right, 96 on the left, or is that a 98, 96, but 96, a little bit of a difference, but not doesn't really jump out at you. Um, of course, now on the right, you're looking at the ganglion cell uh, complex. The right one is normal. The left one, again, if you were just looking at colors, you, you'd say, boy, this looks normal. <laughs> But but again, if you if you look at the thickness map, this is my friend. Thanks, Got Miguel. It. If you look at the you know at this thickness map, you've got that that squeegee cookie cutter defect that really is suggestive, and it goes along with you know kind of what we saw on on the deviation map of this. If you think that there's an RNFL defect, it extends to the macula in a way that you know is makes you be concerned or worried about glaucoma. Um, also, uh, you know, we look at the, at the B scans on the ganglion cell complex and you kind of look at right eye and left eye. And if anything, you can, you can see that, you know, the, the left one maybe on the B scan inferior looks a little thinner compared just relatively speaking. So. Greg, any thoughts here? Yeah, I got a little time to digest it. And jumping down to the quadrants, Joe, if you just go to that inferior quadrant, that 129 versus that 103, um, that's enough. So like it, really at any of the instruments, I start scratching my head in the glaucoma prone zones. You know, so I think, you know, the quadrants are not sensitive enough because it puts everything in there. But I think, you know, 121 on the right eye and 121 on the left eye, but then jump into 129 and 103, that's enough for me to say, okay, let's jump down and now look at the clock hours. And we know glaucoma prone zones on a visual field are kind of that superior temporal, inferior temporal. 
And if we compare, okay, that 149 in the right eye, if you go up, Joe, go up a little bit higher, go up to the part, you go superior, 149 there, you go over there, 123, go down now, there, 147, and then over, oh, you know, so even those, those are green, I mean, that's like a 50 micron change there. That's enough for me to scratch my head, make sure that there's no PVD going on, uh, maybe causing that uh, that right eye to be really, really thick. But that kind of matches kind of where Mark was pointing out up there in that uh, retinal thickness map, that, that, that 93 kind of matches that little area right there. So I'd be a little concerned. And then, then when you go look at the T-SNP map up there, you got that little bit of a drop right there. Yep. So. Exactly. It's within that, yeah. So I mean, there's enough there. And Mark, you you pointed out that squeegee over there. That's kind of a, a good sign. So yeah, I, I call it a nautilus shell. <laughs> you know, you can see the, the horizontal refay. The thickness map to me is very important because this is showing you potentially an artist rendition of a nerve fiber layer defect. I that that's concerning to me. That's very concerning to me. And it's also concerning to me that why these are all normal. Everything falls within a normative data range. But again, as Greg points out, you know, everything is still green, but there is a difference between there's green and there's green. Well, well, and here's the here's the thing about that, right? So there there is a large range of normal. The average person can be anywhere from what 105 or 100 up to 120 on an average thickness. The the tipping point. Uh, on an OCT, at least with the Cirrus, and Greg, you can tell me on the OptiView, that tipping point when you go from green to yellow is at about 75 microns. Uh, and, and so you look at, you know, if you're starting out at 100 or 120, there's a, there's a large range where you can have thinning within that normal range before, boom, you hit the yellow, which is at about 75 microns. And that window from 75 to red, I think is only about 10 microns. So you go from 75 to about 65 and then you're in the red. So, so you're right. Um, now, obviously you wanna see visual field that, you know, this could be from a branch retinal vein occlusion. There could be a lot of stuff going on, certainly suggestive for glaucoma. And I'm not suggesting yet, you know, the, the fun question will be, do we treat or do we not treat? I don't think we have enough information yet, but. Interesting. I'm going to take off on what you said here, Mark. You have this little triangle with an exclamation point right there, and a triangle with an exclamation point right there. And what a lot of people don't realize is on your device, you can actually go on click and it. click it. And what's that? What is, that is trying to tell you is there is a value or some values that are very close to being statistically significant, and that if you reran it, it may come out differently. And you click it, and you can, it tells you exactly what to look at. All right, there are the fields. Little noise in the right eye, little noise in the left eye, low test reliability. I don't really make any decisions. I mean, I wouldn't make any decision on, on that. Okay. I'm going to show you again so you can go back and forth, just making a comparison the, yep. in the structure and function. Yep. yep. So if we're thinking inferior thinning, we should have some type of superior, either nasal step or arcuate. And we really, eh, one point there that's, I don't know what this, you know, is it real or not real, but. It's a five decibel decrease according to this. Greg, your thoughts here? Yeah, uh, you know, the... The right eye, like Mark said, is, is it's basically, you know, it's 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 noise. Certainly doesn't match anything there. You're sitting at minus 1.96. You got the other eye at 1.81. You think it would be worse. Um, you gotta be careful. There's a you know essential defect involved. A um, lot of false negatives, but remember, guys, false positive is what kills a visual field. In glaucoma, you're allowed to have false negatives because, again, when that ganglion cell gets wounded, it can't recover if it's wounded like a healthy ganglion cell. So having a few false negatives is not bad. It's the false positives that kill the visual field, but nothing convincing here. Um, you know, this would, you know, and this would be, you know, with, with at least with the Cirrus now, the new, the new version, we have the 24-2C which gives you extra points within that central, you know, 10 degrees. And it would be, 
So the comment I would make, I would either do a 10 dash. So if I was really worried or concerned, I would do a 10 dash two visual field again, because it's in that glaucoma prone zone as, as Greg kind of pointed out on a couple other cases. So it's in that critical zone. Um, and I would do a 10 dash two to just to see are there points within that central, you know, 10 or five degrees that I need to know about. Or as I said, I would today, I would do a 24 dash two C because it gives me the best of both. Um, because I do think you want to know, are there more points within that central area that are affected? And I was, I was going to ask you guys if you do that, and you, you already had you already answered that question before you even asked. So thank you, Mark. All right, so let's take a look. Here's another OCT, and here is a spectralis, and we can see that there is that in you know inter eye asymmetry here. But interestingly enough, it actually dips into the red on this normative database, whereas it really doesn't on this one. And this is not implying a superiority or inferiority of either of these by any means. You know, I think the big question here, Joe, um, you know, clearly glaucoma suspect, or we could argue maybe it is early glaucoma, right? And I can't remember what the pressures were. They were in the teens, right? 17, 18. I don't have so, the chemistry, unfortunately. Yep. And, and that's fine. But so the question is, all right, is that is that real? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I don't think even if you thought it was real, even if you thought this was early glaucoma, I, I don't think you would treat, you know, just again, based on, you know, normal tension glaucoma study where half the patients, you know, really didn't progress uh, in either group. And the recommendations from the normal tension glaucoma treatment study were that if they have mild disease, you know, you don't treat, you watch, you try to decide, is this going to be one of those progressors or not? We had that discussion a little bit earlier, maybe follow them closer, more fields, more OCTs to decide, is this going to be one of those 50% that will progress, or is it going to be one of the 50% that is, is really going to stay stable? So maybe they've got, as I said, maybe this is an old branch retinal vein occlusion that, that developed, and now we're seeing the after effects of an old BRVO. So, so regardless you know, I'm with, with the fields and the OCTs, I wouldn't treat this patient. I would follow them closely. And again, over time, you, de you decide, is this somebody who's going to be one of those progressors that we will need to treat? Or is it going to be somebody that we can just kind of watch without treatment? So just to, uh, to emphasize a couple of things here, you know, two different OCTs here, everything's within a normative database, but we can see there's an inter-eye asymmetry. Remember the title of this one is looking at all the data. Here on this device, it does fall outside the normative database, but I want to point out is that little, you know, exclamation mark that says, you know, there, there are some values that are very close to being statistically significant. And if you repeat it, it may actually give you different results. So we have no, one, I would, saying, oops, sorry. one saying abnormal. Go ahead, Greg. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. No, um, the, um, the, the, the key here that I point out is we've identified an optic neuropathy. It looks like there's some asymmetry. It looks like there's some damage here. Does it have to be glaucoma? Kind of echoing with Dr. Dunbar, what Mark is saying here. It could be something else. So we've identified that there's a change. There's an asymmetry here. One is you know in the red, one is in the green. If it's glaucoma, the definition of glaucoma is that it will progress over time. If this doesn't progress, maybe it's an old trauma. You know, we get into, I live in Western central Pennsylvania. You know, did they get bopped in the eye playing football, backyard football with an elbow? Did they get hit with a basketball? Is it traumatic? You know, is it, is it vascular as Mark's pointing out here? You know, in this case, just looking at this, we've identified a optic neuropathy. It's just now, is it glaucoma or something else? All right, polling question number six. What's the best diagnosis for this patient? Primary open angle glaucoma, glaucoma suspect, or I don't know, and that's why I'm here. We're, we're going to let you off the hook on this one, Mark. Yeah. Good case. That's those are my favorite ones. Yeah, I think the key here is as this poll's going through here is I think we, you know, we always got concerned with the 
with the red, the yellow, and the and the in the in the red, the red, yellow, and green. I don't even really look at those anymore. I mean, I do, but I kind of just look at the numbers. You know, you, you kind of have to look at the numbers. Nerve fiber layer. You know, I start scratching my head, ten or fifteen microns, and you're looking at the full retina scans. You know, I start scratching my head about fifteen to twenty microns. If there's an asymmetry, if there's a change, you know, it's depending on what we're looking at, you know, it could be a PVD, it could be an epiretinal membrane, whatever's, you know, causing it. But uh, those are kind of the numbers that I look at. GCC is kind of the same way. GCC, 10 or 15 microns, the full retina, 15 to 20 microns. And the only thing that came in the chat uh, box was a kudo to you, Greg, that you made a great point that it's a progressive optic neuropathy. All right, share. Okay. Most people think glaucoma suspect. Others think primary open angle glaucoma. And some have shown a viable uh, answer that, that is, I don't know, and that's why I'm here. So very good. All right. Well, I remember I said, look at all the information. And I found, you know, two things to look at is, look at 2012. These are about five years later. What do you, what do you notice here in 2012? Yeah, I got a disc hemorrhage. Got a disc hemorrhage. And about five years later, what do you, what do you notice? Yep. RNFL defect and another disc hemorrhage. Oh. And so, Joe, what I want to point out on that yeah. disc hemorrhage and what they've shown is that yeah, you know, the disc hemorrhage is not going to be if you can if you can kind of point out where that defect is. Notice how it's just right adjacent to that defect. Notice, see how right there. Point out where the hemorrhage is. Notice how right there the hemorrhage is going from where there's defect to where there's not a defect. And when you see disc hemorrhages like that, you know, that's usually a sign that it's progressing. It's not going to be in, in the center of that. You know, if you had a really wide nerve fiber layer dropout, if you guys are watching me here on the camera, if you had a really wide nerve fiber layer dropout, it's not going to be here. It's going to be here or down here because it's progressing. So those are really cool pictures. So that's a great one to point out. So there, there are a lot of things I, I, want, I want to point out here. It isn't an easy case. We have to look at a lot of data. There are two OCTs that said the same thing, but maybe you can say disagreed with one another. As Mark pointed out, the, the function didn't match any of the structure. You know, there, what are we to believe? Do we believe that inner eye asymmetry? Uh, do we believe the serous? You know, there's a lot of things here we have to look at, but don't forget the photograph. You know, look at the optic nerve and see. And what I else would is predict that over time that that he he probably does develop a pretty dense, you know, nasal step superior arcuate just based on the location of where your disc hemorrhage RNFL defect is. I, I would bet that this really does manifest as a pretty pretty definitive typical defect. But what what was one thing we never saw on the OCTs, either of them? We didn't see a disc hemorrhage. Correct. Because it doesn't show it. That's where we have to look at these patients. Mm -hmm. And is this a progressive neuropathy? The answer is yes. You know, as Greg points out, look at the nerve fiber layer here. There is no defect. Several years later, there it is. So we definitely have progression. And one thing that I've learned, and guys agree or disagree and share your, your experience, when I see a true disc hemorrhage, a glaucomatous disc hemorrhage like this, I anticipate seeing one of these later. Mm -hmm. And other hemorrhages of the disc, PVD, branch retinal vein occlusion, none of these things result in this. When we have the true glaucomatous hemorrhage is the only thing that results in the subsequent wedge defect. So don't over rely on any one piece of information, put it all together. The fields look pretty good. OCT look pretty good. Some things we didn't expect, you know, the risk factor is kind of low. So this is a really a kind of a challenging case. We have to look at everything. And I guess it brings me to poll, polling question number seven now. We, now that we have all the data, Greg, if you want to launch that. Yeah, and Joe, I think I kind of want to just kind of echo, and it probably happens to you, and it probably happens to Mark, but, you know, I get quite a few cases as, you know, being a speaker and, you know, lecturing, and people want me to take a, look turn at, it on. taking a look at an OCT, um, so on and so forth. 
And, you know, they send you OCTs, they send you visual fields, they send you all this data. And then, you know, what do we always want to know? What does the nerve look like? And then, you know, it's kind of funny. I'm glad you brought it up, that picture, because how many times do we hear like, oh, I don't have a picture of the nerve? Mm -hmm. you know, so I think with all this technology that's out there that we've got away from imaging the nerve and let's not forget to image that nerve. So, I mean, it happens quite a bit. Like, hey, and can by, you show me what by, the nerve looks like? So. And by image, you mean take a picture. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Take a picture. Mm -hmm. not, well, not, it, it, it's become economic. And you're right. I think we're still trying to figure it out. So, you know, if you can't do a visual field. I mean, you can't do an OC. Well, you can't get paid for an OCT and a fundus photo on the same day. And so how do you manage that? And, and you know, you want to be able to while they're dilated to get a good fundus photo and and also while you're dilated to get an rnfl and and really anymore you know we may you know do it on different days you know because the oct devices are so good you don't really need a dilated pupil in many instances to get a a, a decent rnfl or a gcc scan but, but yeah i think we're still trying to work out how to how to maximize you know getting the information and obviously getting the information and being able to get it paid for right to, so and what I like to remind people is glaucoma, open angle glaucoma is generally a disease of months and years, not days and weeks. You know, we don't have to solve all the world's problems in one day. We can bring it back for more information. You know, I, I, in terms of treatment, as I said, on that initial visit, I, I still don't think I would have treated. I mean, I, I might treat your five years later where you show the RNFL defect. Mm -hmm. I still would like to see the visual field, but, but I don't know that the presence of the disc hemorrhage alone, I would have said, aha, Disc hemorrhage, glaucoma. I need. I need to treat. Well, I, I will share to you how how this really transpired. You know, when I showed you, the patient did have a disc hemorrhage at the time of my visit. I took the photographs. I also had uh, prior to my ever seeing the patient, there, there was a old disc photo five years earlier that showed me you know, another disc hemorrhage previously and a normal nerve fiber layer. So there had been changes. This is one of those things I probably began treatment or brought the, wanted to bring the patient back and the patient ultimately was lost to follow up. Mm -hmm. I think we probably have time for a fairly quick one. Uh, let's see, no, I'm gonna skip this one. We're going to wrap up and I'm going to see what your thoughts are here. This one, this one would, would, I think, engender just a tad bit more discussion. Is non-compliance always a bad thing? She's a 68-year-old female who's ocular hypertensive. And I am telling you that truthfully, not like the first case, that, that this is truly ocular hypertension. Here are, her, here are her pressures. Her lowest was in the low 20s but consistently she is in the 30s. Pachymetry 605 and 604, we can see that we can see the list of pressures there. We can see the list of vertical CD ratios. She, she, got, uh, she got worse, she got worse, she got better again, which tells you the, the lack of validity of CD ratios. Gonioscopy is there. She's all nice and open here. Okay, guys, have you had enough time to look at the information? Mm -hmm. All right. There are her nerves, there is her OCT, and there are her visual fields. Robust RNFL. Absolutely normal with absolutely normal fields. Greg, anything to add in here? Yeah, everything, everything looks good. Okay. So it comes down to a question of treat or observe. We got central coronal thickness, 605, 604. The pressure is consistently in the low 30s. And I'm just going to remind you what everything looks like. And I think, Greg, that brings me to polling question number nine. Okay, give me a second mm -hmm. to click to nine. What's the best management for this patient? Treat, observe, or refer to Mark Gunbar. How old is the patient again, Joe? 
that's a good question. 68. Well, this is a tough one. And how many years, Joe, has those pressures been up like that? Good go question. Back. 2009. Well, 2011, 2011 to 2015 is when she began in the 30s. Okay, so about four years. Okay. And a few years before that in the, in the 20s. Yep. You're right, Mark. This, this kind of is a harder one. And it is open to debate, conjecture, speculation. I think we're doing well. I'm going to end the poll and share the results. 25% want to, uh, to treat, 67% want to uh, observe, and the other 8% want to refer to Mark Dunbar. <laughs> so Mark, let me ask you this. Taking the last option off, referring to yourself, what would you do? You know, I, I said treat. I, I, I think a 30, 32s, you know, and, and, and by treat, I'd, I'd probably recommend an SLT. You know, I, I think, you know, low risk, but I, I think at some, you know, is he going to go blind? I don't think he's going to go blind. Um, you know, do you want to submit him to a prostaglandin? And, and you know, he, you're, you'll do fine on a prostaglandin. Um, I just think 32 is just a little bit chronically 32. You know, every now and then a 32 is, is not a bad problem, I think. You know, when you're in even up to 34, right? 32, 34. I just think you're, it's just not healthy. And I think it, eventually you, you're going to run out of uh, luck. And so I, I would probably recommend an SLT on them. Greg, what about you? Yeah, I mean, a couple of different ways. I do have a couple of patients, 28 to 32 in a practice that I'm following and not treating. I, I really have gone to custom of really liking to know what the cornea hysteresis is here. If we're talking, you know, kind of, you know, current, you know, back in the day, some of these cases that you had where we didn't have cornea hysteresis, cornea, cornea hysteresis is high here. I would talk to the patient and tell them that their eye has the ability to dampen energy. They have a low cornea hysteresis. I'd probably lean on where Mark is. I would say, look, you know, you don't have damage here. We have to work as a team. What's your comfort level? on this, I don't have to recommend treatment other than the fact that we start knowing that chronically around that 32, 34 mark that you statistically over time will get damage. And I would kind of leave it as, as the, uh, as, as, is working as a team with this. You know, I tell the patients, I don't like doing a lot of CYA and I explain to the paper person that, you know, it's cover your ass back in the day, we would put drops on people. Um, but you know, let's work as a team here. If you're, you know, nervous about it, let's get that SLT. I agree. That's a, that's a great treatment, especially if the cornea hysteresis is low, cornea hysteresis is high and they want to follow as long. I say to them, I'll follow you like a glaucoma patient. I'm going to see you every three to four months. I better see you in here because if we see damage, we want to treat you. So. so I'm going to go to do a couple of qu quick questions here with the diagnosis with ocular hypertension and mild glaucoma. And will insurance pay for a medication for the ocular hypertensive diagnosis? My, my diagnosis would be ocular hypertension. Uh, insurance should pay for, for the medication with the ocular hypertensive diagnosis. And somebody says, run this case through an OATS risk calculator. What do you think about that, fellas? Well, I think from your graph, we kind of know what it is, right? I mean, on your, on your table, the, even with the thick cornea and a higher pressure, you know, you're, you're in that, you know, seven to eight percent five year risk category of a thick cornea and a pressure of 32. So it's it's not 15 percent, as you suggested, where that's maybe considered high and, and you would recommend treatment. You're below 10 percent. You're probably eight or nine percent in a risk calculator. Mm -hmm. And that would be probably, you know, the recommendation would be probably to not treat based on the risk calculator. So and I think and let's throw some diabetes in there and give them some protection. Yeah. <laughs> and what Greg well, you're I, saying I, is, I, you know, there, there's other very, you know, I had one that was, you know, not at all this high. She had a pressure of 24, 25. She's an attorney and a pilot has her pilot's license. And she was 
deathly afraid of of potentially losing her pilot's license because of vision or or you know or or glaucoma and so uh you know she wanted to be treated even though her risk was even lower than that you know she was just one of those she could she wouldn't be able to sleep at night she was really really concerned and one thing to uh point out you know this is a person at a 605 cornea remember the very first patient that i presented who had 610 corneas developed glaucoma yeah. So even people with thick corneas can develop glaucoma. So always, always remember that. You know, interestingly, my mood that day, Mark, oh, <laughs> and one thing I should say, when we talk about treatment, we mean therapeutic, you know, interventional pressure reduction. Observation is a form of treatment. It's just a treatment without altering the risk factors. We're observing them. Now, I was of your I was of your mindset, Mark. And this, you know, when I saw the patient and the mood I was in, you know, it was, you know, let's go ahead and treat you. Yeah. you know, she's been hitting 34 a couple of times. You know, that was sort of outside the, the realm of oats. You know, they felt uncomfortable watching those patients. So I made the recommendation to uh, treat, and uh, she declined. And we agreed close follow-up. So I set her for a three-month follow-up, and she uh, she returned promptly three years later. So now, <laughs> promptly, yeah, promptly three years later. <laughs> now here's what she looks like three years later. I'll let you I'll let you digest that information. Yeah, it's budged. Joe, are we done with polling questions? Because I'm going to shut this down if these are if we're done, or do you have more uh comments? Uh, we have one more polling question. Okay, I'll leave them up then. Okay. So any change there, guys? Looks like she's developed an epiretinal membrane maybe, right? In the, in the, in the left eye. And that's why you got this little thicker segment there. Possibly. Abnormally so, thick. Polling question number 10. Let me pull it up. Now, what's the best management for this patient? Treat, observe, or refer to Mark Dunbar? <laughs> so now she, she had pressure in the 30s for four, for four years. Now we're seven years in. Oh, and by the way, her pressure was in the mid 30s at that point. You're aware? What were they? Mid thirties or low thirties. Same thing. It, it really had nothing had budged. Yeah. All right. I think we got it. We got end poll. Looks like Mark. Unfortunately, people are losing faith in you. They are referring <laughs> less for. They're feeling feeling more comfortable with their own management, but uh, I don't think we change much uh, in terms of thought processes here. My approach was, well, I think you were right. I was wrong. We're going to continue watching you. I'll see you every six months. And Greg, Mark, I think that's about it. We're really at our time. I have more cases here. It was a lot of fun. I mean, doing this with you guys, for me, is like a night off. Yeah, it's fun. It's great to talk about cases. And I hope the audience enjoyed it, too. It's always fun. I'm going to stop sharing now. Greg, I want you, if you want to take over.